the praise and glory. I really love you, Jesus. I adore you. I adore you. I bow down before you. Cause there's no one like you. Every time I call on Jesus, I get power in the name. I get joy in the name. Everybody, Jesus, you're so worthy. Jesus, the all that's it, of all the praise, of all the praise. I really love you. I really love you. I adore you. I adore you. I adore you. I adore you. I bow down before you. Because there's no one like you. Everybody say there's power in the name. There's Holy Ghost power. Everybody, Jesus, you're so worthy. Jesus, you're so of all the praise, of all the praise. I really love you. I adore you. I I adore you. I bow down before you. Cause there's no one like you. Everybody say, say Jesus. Say Jesus. Say Jesus. Say Jesus. Power in the name. Salvation in the name. Healing in the name. Joy in the name. Love in the name. Salvation in the name. Everybody, Jesus, you're so worthy. Jesus, you're so worthy. Of all the praise. Of all the praise. I really love you, Jesus. I adore you. I adore you. I bow down before you. Cause there's no one like you. Jesus. Listen, the Lord has been good to us. He's been kind to us. He woke us up this morning and he didn't even have to do it. And I believe that some of us take waking up for granted. But there's somebody that laid down last night that wasn't able to get up this morning. It wasn't because of anything that they did, but it was because the Lord decided to bring them on to glory. And, and the very fact that you have breath in your lungs, and it's God's breath, the very fact that you have blood running warm in your veins, the very fact that you can look at me and I can look at you, the very fact that you can wave your hand and you can move your feet, all to give you some sign that Jesus is truly worthy in this place. And I'm not trying to play with your emotions, but if the Lord has done anything for you, can you just show some sign in this room? Come on, can you show how grateful you are to him? Can you show how much you love him? Can you show how much you adore him? Can you show how much you glorify him? Come on, has he been good to you? Has he made a way for you? Has he opened up doors for you? Has he made a way out of nowhere? Everybody, Jesus, you're so worthy. Jesus, you're so worthy. Of the praise and glory. Yes, God, I, I really love you, Jesus. I adore you, Jesus. I adore you. I adore you. I bow down. For who you are, for who you are, oh yes, for who you are. We worship you, we worship you, just for who, just for who you are. Yes, God, for who you are, for who you are, for who you are. We worship, we worship, we worship, we worship. We worship you, 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 yeah, we worship you, just for who you are, hallelujah, we glorify you.
Let the people of God say amen. Say amen again. We worship you, God, for who you are. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to ask if you're able, if you would stand with me in reverence to the reading of God's holy word. And the word of God comes to us today from or in the gospel according to Luke chapter 6 verse 37 which we shared last Sunday and we also want to go over to Romans chapter 8 verses 1 and 2 in the good news translation Luke's gospel again says do not judge others and God will not judge you do not condemn others and God will not condemn you forgive others and God will forgive you. And then Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, there is no condemnation now for those who live in union with Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit, which brings us life in union with Christ Jesus, has set me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. You may be seated in God's house, the word of God, for the people of God. Thanks be to God for his word. Amen. I'd like to tag this particular text and this message as we continue our series we began at the beginning of the year entitled There Is No Box, but I would like to tag this particular text and message with the title No Condemnation. No Condemnation. Uh, there used to be a television show I didn't come up with the name, but it was a television show on MTV, and it was called Pimp My Ride. I didn't come up with the name, it just was the name of the show. Interestingly, on the show, uh, the host would show up at somebody's house, the owner of their car turns over their keys, and the mechanics take the car to a shop called West Coast Customs. The guys at West Coast Customs begin to immediately start to work on this raggedy, roughed up car. The guys, they don't just work on the outside, they also do some work on the interior of the automobile. They do what's called an extreme makeover for the car. What I love most about the show, about that show, is how at the end they show the before photo and they show the after photo, and most of the time, the before and after photos look like two totally different automobiles. See, one of the problems that happens when we convict people and condemn them, the problem that arises when we sentence people through our looks and our gossip is that we don't give them a chance to get from their before photo to their after photo. See, the fact is that all of us, all of us say all, 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 all of us need to turn the keys of our lives over to God and allow God to do an extreme makeover in our lives. Uh, by the time he finishes with you, the before and after clips of your life will be extremely different pictures. Uh, so don't risk selling somebody short because you condemn them just because they're a work in progress, but take a step back and reflect on where God has brought you from from. Uh, F.B. Meyer said that when you see a brother or a sister in sin, there are two things that you do not know yet. First, you don't know how hard they tried not to sin. And then secondly, you don't know the power of the forces that have assailed them. Uh, you also don't know what you would have done in the same circumstances. You, you do know Paul pushed us to always be reflective when he says, when I would do good, evil is always present. Uh, and guess what we've done? We've rationalized that evil is from the outside. That there's always evil trying to stop me from doing what God wants me to do from the outside. To be sure, there is evil outside. But Paul is literally talking about how each of us has evil inside of us. When I would do good, evil is always in me trying to stop me from being led by the Spirit of God. It's not just out there, but evil is in here. How, how, how do I know? How do I know if I push you just right? 
if I, if I push the right button, if I, I hit the right note, if I, I mess with you just the right way, I, I, every now and then, that, that old evil, that, 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 all oh, those words that, that you didn't have, felt like you haven't said in years, they, they somehow easily, they, you thought they were gone. You thought you didn't talk like that no more, but don't push me. I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose, to lose my head. uh -huh. <laughs> and, and, and Minister Chuck Chavers, he reminded me that it's not just in some of us. See, some of us like to sit and pretend like it ain't in us. But, but the Bible declares that it's not just in some of us. You, you, you're not exempt. I'm not exempt. None of us are exempt. It's in all of us. But, but, but the text, the good news is that the same all of us who do sin and fall short of the glory of God, the same all of us who have evil in us, if you keep reading Romans, you discover that all of us, that same all are made right with God by grace through the redemption that came through Jesus the Christ. Uh, in a real sense, every saved person in here, you got a past. You got a past. I got a past. The deacons got a pass. Every preacher on this pulpit has, has a pass. The folk in the balcony got a pass. Wherever you sit in this pew, you got a pass. I got a pass. We all got a pass. And guess what? The good news is every sinner has a future. So we cannot be in the business of condemnation because we know what it feels like. When I would do good, evil is always present. And, if, and guess what? If you're so perfect, if you showed up today, uh, honestly, honestly, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not chastising you, but if, if you're so perfect and you're so, so self-righteous and you're so sanctified that you can sit and condemn people, then I would encourage you that you and your sanctified self need to do a better job of being a witness. If you are, if that's you, it, maybe you have achieved the heights of self-actualization and you, can, you are spiritually mature and you got all of this thing figured out. And if you got it like that, then you got to be a better witness. Won't you help somebody else grow in their faith? You ought to be a model of inspiration and hope of love and grace. And the real talk is that we can't sit in seats of sanctimonious sensationalism because people in the world and in the church are being crushed every day. Crushed by a criminal injustice system. Crushed by apathy and moral decay. Crushed by low aim and low drive. Crushed by low expectations and no expectations. Crushed by violence and vindictive vices. Crushed by redlining and retaliation. And the only only way people stop being crushed is if somebody comes by and helps lift the weight off of them. Let me add parenthetically you, you, yeah, that, that you know uh, for the last 50 years uh, since the civil rights legislation passed, we could at least count on the fact that politicians would, would send out dog whistles, that, that their racism wouldn't be so so in your face. We At least the last 50 years they had to hide it just just a little bit. They had to hide it under, under some bushels and they had to keep it under wraps. But, but now, racism has been given a megaphone in our political discourse. Uh, people's private thoughts are serving as the platform for their political campaign. There used to be a universal understanding that using the term monkey to describe a black person or any person for that matter was completely unacceptable because of its vile history. But now we are being told that the truth ain't the truth. What you heard ain't what you heard. What, there are such things as alternative facts that what you see ain't really what you see don't believe what you see believe what i say that that, that ain't what i meant and we're on a fast descent into a place that it's going to take us generations to recover from the term monkey up that ain't even a real term you ever heard that term before in your life we gonna monkey up what, what in the world does, does that mean? So this guy had to invent something to try to send a signal to the voters of Florida that Andrew Gillum, the next governor of Florida, and Stacey Abrams, the next governor of Georgia, are not human beings uh, capable of leading a state. You do know 11 million white Americans identify themselves as white nationalists or neo-Nazis. We're being crushed. 
Now, now, right at the border of Texas, they're denying our Hispanic brothers and sisters who are American citizens. They are denying them their passports on the southern border. They can't get back into a country that belongs to them. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, I never thought that, that Jefferson Beauregard Sessions was going to ensure justice for all, but now they're denying American citizens entry into their own country. So guess what, church? There needs to be a place, a safe haven, a safe space where all people can come and will be embraced no matter what their preconditions might be, and that place must be God's house. And all of our judgment and condemnation does is it piles more and more on when you are cunningly condemning. You are participating in keeping your foot on somebody's neck. And the problem with being crushed is that you can start to believe that a crushed existence is the only existence you can have. W.B. Du Bois said that you're not in, in the, you're, what you're in cannot damage you unless what you're in starts to get inside of you. And when you believe that your crushed existence is the only existence for you, then somebody has to come and help you bear the weight. The church cannot be an organization or another organization that participates in crushing folk. And you crush people by how you look at them, how you talk to them, how you ignore them, how you devalue their ideas, how you overlook them. The church is not in the crushing business because Jesus is in the salvage business. If you don't believe me, just look at your own life. He takes little and makes it much. He takes nothing and makes it something. He takes violence and makes value. Takes nowhere and makes it somewhere. He takes trouble and makes triumph. Takes hunger and sends you bread. Takes death and makes new life. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. I've already pulled up to the text, the triumphant trumpeter of truth from Tarsus. He tells the new Roman Baptist church that there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And who better than the apostle Paul, who started out his life as a tormentor of terror for the church, to write the, to a newly developing church, a church built on the center of idolatry, a church built in the center of greed, a church formed in the crucible of an oppressive government system that disproportionately tax its poorest people, a place that used some people as chattel bought and sold as property. And so it sounds like I'm talking about us. It was in his place that he tells the church, he tells the marginalized, the oppressed, the dejected, the downtrodden, the uplifted, and the upwardly mobile, anybody that shows up, that there is no condemnation in Jesus. What a powerful word for people who have only known systems of unfair punishments and laws that only some people had to follow while others were above the law, where Wall Street is always bailed out. But Kinsman and Buckeye and Martin Luther King Boulevard are always left out. Paul understands how, based on societal standards, Jesus should not have changed his life. He should have charged him and convicted him. But instead, he was greeted in Damascus by the grace of God. So he writes this missive to the masses in hopes that they would not start a new social club. That wasn't why the church was created. But rather, they would be a force for freedom and liberation for every person that God sends in his path. He didn't want the church to be a diligent duty for you to show up just because it's Sunday, but he wanted it to be a life-changing relationship. There is no condemnation. I know the law. I know the rules, but I'm not capable of following all of these rules, all of the spiritual laws. But in Jesus, I'm free to follow Jesus. And if I follow Jesus, then I'm following what God wants me to do. Oh, yes, there's still condemnation as a consequence of my sin, but not in if I'm in Christ Jesus. So, so who, are, who are we? Who are we? Who am I? Who am I to condemn somebody or degrade somebody when Romans teaches me that if I'm in the path of Christ, he's declared me not guilty of every charge you can make against me. When you connect with Jesus, your sentence is declared not guilty. Not guilty of my past wrongs and my indiscretions, though my sins be as scarlet. He has washed them and he made them clean. Uh, condemnation literally means to pass a sentence upon. While judgment means having an opinion of somebody and convicting them without a cause or justification, condemnation is the process of naming them according to how you judge them. Uh, according to this scripture, much like judgment, you play a dangerous game with the Lord uh, when you start condemning folk, uh, when you convict people based only on circumstantial evidence uh, or whether or not they fit into the neat box of our social 
social order, when you convict folk because of how they look, uh, their ethnicity, their sexual orientation, their culture, their language, their dress, or their religion, uh, when you convict folk because they've been misguided or miseducated or misinformed, uh, convict folk because they don't have your academic pedigree, uh, when you convict folk because of the color of their skin, uh, when you convict folk because of how much money they make uh, or how little money they make, uh, when you convict folk because they're homeless or hopeless or hapless or even heartless, uh, the Bible says uh, there's no condemnation. Uh, you do know old Mary Magdalene had this problem. Uh, she was called Magdalene not because that was her last name. Uh, her last name is not Magdalene, uh, but because it was where she was from. Uh, and contrary to 45's ignorant opinion, uh, let me drop on him that my Haitian brothers and sisters are not from S-hole countries, uh, but have an invaluable heritage. Uh, and my Nigerian brothers and my sisters uh, are a dynamic people. Uh, both places that have been condemned by this White House uh, have an invaluable heritage and history and an unstoppable destiny despite the difficulties that have been imposed on them by imperialism, militarism, and nihilism. Uh, Mary was from Magdala and it was a place where all of the prostitutes were known to hang out and because she was from there she was condemned to being called Mary Magdalene. And the real truth is, we don't know if Mary was a part of the prevalent profession of her hometown. But what we do know is that some church folk got together. Some religious leaders got together. The religious elite got together and condemned her to being called Mary Magdalene. Yeah, the church has, has, a, 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 has some, some things that we have done. You, you, remember, you remember the woman, the brothers wanted to stone her. In, in the courtyard, she, she was convicted, condemned for adultery. And, and, and Jesus said to the brothers who were one that had rocks in the hand, he said, let he who was without sin cast the first stone. The question is, how did they know she was an adulteress? How did those brothers, how did the brothers line the how? How did... How did, there was no internet. There was no, there was no telephone. How? How did they, how did they know? That's why Jesus, I believe Jesus, he, he, he just looked at them and he probably turned his back on them and said, y'all, first, first one, first one that's clean. That's clean. You clean, completely clean, you throw the first rock. And, 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 and they dropped them and left. How did they know how? How, how, how did they know? Uh, we, we, we don't know. And, and anytime we identify people based on where they work or where they grew up or where they live or what culture they're from or who their parents are or were, we put them in a little box and we try to package them in a way that makes us feel comfortable. Uh, if I keep the pressure on you, then, then I get out of letting the light be shined on my life. Cause, so as long as I keep it on you, the focus on you, the focus on your life and your problems and your issues and your things, as long as I keep, some people like to talk about others so that the light is never shined on me. So what if I'm not perfect? So what if I made some mistakes? God still calls me his friend. Uh, nobody on this earth has a right or responsibility to pass sentence on you because if you're in Jesus, the sentence has already been rendered and the sentence is not guilty. Uh, in heaven's court, when God looks at those who have a relationship with Jesus, when he looks at his children of salvation, when he looks at folk who believe that Christ died for them, he sees because of Jesus what he sees is not guilty not guilty not Nike Nike signed LeBron James you remember LeBron was 17 18 years old Nike signed LeBron James to at that time a hundred million dollar endorsement contract they signed him to his contract before he ever stepped foot on an NBA professional court they signed a high school player to this contract before he ever played in the NBA. At that time, when Nike looked at LeBron, they didn't see a high school athlete that he was. They also saw the superstar that LeBron could be. So Nike endorsed LeBron James because of his potential. Guess what? When God looks at you, he's not stuck on who you are right now. 
When, when God looks at you, he's not stuck on who you were yesterday. He, he's not stuck on any of that. But what God sees when he looks at you is he sees the superstar in you and he endorses you because of what he knows you can be. Uh, whenever people try to wrongly condemn, when you try to sentence you to a mundane life, when they try to mislabel or misidentify you, when they start to wrongly label your family, then you must build the resolve in your spirit to know and to share with everybody that they're not in the place of God. Uh, remember that they're not your maker, they're not your creator, they're not responsible for you getting here, and they ain't going to be responsible when you leave here. Uh, they're not your judge, they're not your jury, they're not who's going to call the role when your name is called up yonder. They're not the one that sits high and looks low. They're not in the place of God. So instead of letting their condemnation get you down, instead of letting it make you angry, instead of getting sad about miserable folk, and remember you serve a God who calls you not guilty, so their condemnation cannot contain your life not guilty but the question the text pushes me to raise is multifaceted today is not only how do I overcome condemnation but also what can I do to avoid becoming condemning of other people Luke Luke told us that if you're not condemning others then the text says you shall not be condemned there are two answers I'm going to give, and, and we'll get ready uh, to give and go to the Lord's table in order first to avoid being a condemner. The, the first thing you got to do, this is about your memory. Last week, we talked about remembering some things. I want to want to keep that theme going. The first thing you got to remember is you got to remember God's recycling process. You got to remember God's recycling process. You're looking at me crazy. Paul says that the salve that soothes and stabilizes your life is, is Jesus to Christ. And Jesus offers a prolific, prodigious, and powerful recycling process that transforms and changes anybody and anything into what he wants you to be. Uh, oh, they, most of you know what this recycling process is all about. In these days and times, you know when they recycle, they take a plastic bottle or an aluminum can, and even though they're empty and their contents have been used, uh, the laws of sanitation won't permit the tin can or the plastic bottle to be reused without going through a process. Uh, if you put them in an appropriate container, they find their way to a dump that specializes in restoring recyclable material. But even if you put your aluminum can in the trash can, uh, there's somebody at the dump who finds as many of them as they can to try to send them through the recycling process. They take those old cans and those plastic bottles and they melt them down and run them through a refining process. And after after a while, uh, what you've thrown out comes back as a brand new can. Uh, can I remind you that God has a recycling process uh, with your life? Uh, and when you condemn somebody, you are devaluing God's recycling process. Uh, God has a process, uh, to be sure. Uh, that's why Joseph could say to his brothers, uh, you thought evil against me, uh, but God meant it unto good. Uh, what you thought would be bad times for me, uh, God has a recycling process to turn it into my good time. Uh, what you thought would be my downfall. Fall, uh, God turned into my uprising. Uh, what you thought would be my misery, uh, God turned it into my mission. Uh, what you thought would be my shame, uh, God turned into my success. Uh, condemned, but now I'm a new creature. Uh, out, but now I'm in. Uh, pain, but now I got peace. Uh, hell, but now I got hallelujah. Don't you ever forget that God uses the recycling process in your life every day. Uh, his recycling process starts uh, early in the morning. Uh, you know what it is? Uh, it's that new mercy you got. Uh, and it's mercy that gives you the chance uh, to change and make a difference. Uh, mercy ought to make you help somebody else. Uh, mercy ought to cause you to see that you got flaws and make your own mistakes. Uh, mercy ought to remind you that you don't have the authority to condemn anybody. Uh, oh, it takes somebody who's arrogant and self-righteous uh, to condemn somebody else because all of us do sin uh, and we got to die to our own nature every day. Uh, so in terms of your record of transgressions, uh, in terms of your diary of bad decisions, uh, I'm no better than you are uh, but for the grace of God uh, but because of God's recycling process I got a chance today to be better than I was yesterday how do I know about this recycling process because my Bible my, my Bible is clear it, it tells me we've been man do it for a night but 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 it's recycled into joy 
I heard the songwriter say, today the battle cry, but tomorrow is recycled into the victor's song. God can and will recycle any part of your life. Jacob would tell you that he can recycle your name. David will tell you he'll recycle your position and move you from the, from the shepherd's stable to, to the king's palace. He can recycle your vision. He can recycle your impact. He will recycle your hope. And when God recycles your life, you come back better than you ever been before. This, though, is not a one-time event. You need to be recycled every day that you live on this earth. Daily you need to change. So instead of focusing on somebody else, instead of lifting up somebody else's drama, start focusing on how I can be a better example of what God wants me to be. A better example of justice. A better example of love. Because God has a recycling process for everybody in here and everybody in the world. And when he gets through with you, you come back brand new. Brand new in your outlook. Look, huh? brand new in your dreams, huh? brand new in your testimony, huh? brand new in your stride, huh? brand new in your commitment, huh? brand new in your focus, huh? brand new in your faithfulness, huh? new in my devotion, huh? new in my integrity, huh? new in my confidence, huh? new in my peace, huh? new in my standards, huh? new in my fervor. Huh? Just remember God is able huh? to recycle my life. Huh? The songwriter was right. Huh? He'll change my state of mind. Huh? He'll change my way with words. Huh? He'll change my heart and he'll give me a brand new song but I gotta appreciate that my God is able he'll recycle our government he'll recycle our neighborhoods he'll recycle our cities he'll recycle our despair remember God's recycling process not only not only do you need to remember God's recycling process but secondly and finally you gotta remember his recycling process but the reason that there's no, no condemnation. You got to remember God's redemptive plan for you. There is no condemnation because of Jesus' liberation. Why? Because in Christ you are justified, edified, sanctified, beautified, and God always gets glorified. Remember his redemptive plan for you. Later in this letter to Rome, to the Roman church, Paul tells us that nothing shall separate us from the love of God. And he tells us over in the 10th chapter that if you believe, you shall be saved. This, this eighth chapter is simply setting the stage for the grand announcement of salvation and redemption. Paul is building his case to this new church that salvation does not come through the law and through legalism, through doctrine and dogma, but it only comes through Jesus. As a matter of fact, this was the plan since sin showed up in the world. So if you're going to uh, no condemnation life, if you're going to live that, you got to remember God's redemptive plan for you. And God's plan is tailor-made to your individual situation. Since all do sin, all of us need a personal Savior who sets us free from our sinful nature. So Jesus will be for you whatever you need him to be. That, that's why you can call God Jehovah Jireh because when you need providing, God provides for you. That, that's why you can call him El Shaddai because he, when you need more than enough, guess what he'll be? He'll be more than enough. He's bread when I'm hungry, water when I'm thirsty, a rock in a weary land. He's my lawyer in a courtroom, doctor in a sick room. He's my rock in a weary land, shelter in the time of storm, rose of Sharon, lion of Judah, ancient of days, the wheel in the middle of the wheel. Whatever I need, Jesus will be whatever it is that I need him to be. And because of God's redemptive plan, you are now free. As a matter of fact, Paul tells you that if you remember God's redemptive plan for you, you learn how to testify if God be for us. That, that's how you get that. That's how you get that testimony. You got to trust God's plan. You got to trust God's redemptive plan. If God be for us, then nothing and nobody can stand successfully against us. See, Paul parks here for the Romans and he tells them that, that, that that's what redemption is about. This notion that God is always for you. That, that's what redemption is about. That God is always for you. You, no matter what's going on in you or around you, God is with you and never against you. God is for you and not your enemy. God is on your side and not in cahoots with the devil. God is real and not an illusion. God is near and never far away. God is faithful and not negligent. You got to remember God's redemptive plan for you. That There's a brick in the brick making industry. It's called a clinker brick. Clinker bricks are bricks that don't quite make it. For some reason or another, they come out of, out, of, uh, out of the brick maker, the kiln, misshapen and deformed. I read about this Presbyterian church in New York, in the state of New York, that was intentionally built with all clinker bricks. 
Apparently, the congregation wanted to send a message, so they built their church of imperfect, rejected bricks. Help me, Holy Ghost. They, they built their church with imperfect, rejected bricks. In a real sense, you do know you and I are clinker bricks. We are sinners. We are imperfect people full of flaws and quirks and oddities. But through Jesus' redemptive plan, we become living stones in his church. And you don't become a living stone because you are so wonderful. It's because, because I am so great. It is Christ who is great. And in Jesus, your service can touch somebody. In Jesus, your service transforms. In Jesus, you can uplift and encourage. So keep on smiling. Keep on loving. Keep on praying. Keep on pushing, uh, keep on pressing, uh, keep on serving, uh, keep on speaking, uh, keep on giving. Uh, remember God's redemptive plan for your life. His plan. Salvation for the lost. Grace for the guilty, mercy for the messy, welcome for the wanderer, hope for the hopeless, joy for sorrow, peace for your pain, hope for tomorrow. You, you, you got to say, I am redeemed. Uh, we got to go. But before we check out, I need to tell you the reason that your life can be recycled and the reason that we've been redeemed. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let me try it, Let me try it like this. I went, I went back this week because I wanted to remember what dignity and integrity looked like when it was in the White House. I wanted to remember what people didn't when people didn't have to come on television and make excuses for the president's tweets or his abhorrent behavior, what moral courage and values look like. So I went back and I watched President Barack Obama's final State of the Union speech this week. I, I, I watched it. I watched it because I wanted to see. I, I wanted to feel good. I wanted to feel good about, about my president. And it, it was, in my opinion, his state best State of the Union address that he had in all of his time in the White House. He, uh, the, 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 the president always addressed policy. He was always eloquent. But this year, that year in particular, for a moment, the brother left Occidental College and Columbia. He left the halls of Harvard Law School. He left Honolulu, Hawaii. He left the penthouse and Park Avenue. And guess what? He went south side of Chicago on the belligerent bullies in Congress that year. He said, I don't have any more campaigns to win. And there were some insolent, petulant, repugnant folk who started standing up and clapping that he said he couldn't run anymore. But south side president, he he kicked Harvard president out and when they said he couldn't run anymore uh, he kicked that Hawaii President Obama to the curb for a moment when through their sarcastic applause uh, he hollers back at them uh, I already won two of them uh, I got Jesus joy uh, and Jesus jubilation uh, when I remembered that you and I already won two of them uh, we won on Friday uh, on a hill far away uh, I won on Friday because he was wounded for my transgressions uh, I won on Friday because he was bruised for my iniquity I, I won on Friday because they nailed him to a tree. I, I won on Friday because they put him in a tomb. I, he was bruised on Friday, I, wounded on Friday, I, humiliated on Friday, I, isolated on Friday, I, dehumanized on Friday, I, mocked on Friday. I, but I believe I, that he remembered his father I, as a recycling process I, and was reminded I, of his own testimony I, that if you destroy this temple I, in three days, I will rebuild. I, he was clowned on Friday. Uh, oppressed on Friday, uh, detect detected on Friday, uh, he died on Friday, uh, was dead on Saturday, uh, but then I also won, uh, not just because of Friday, uh, but my Bible says uh, that I won on Sunday, because uh, early uh, on Sunday morning, uh, God had a recycling process, uh, and Jesus got up uh, with all power in his hands, uh, he testified uh, that I already won, uh, both of them, uh, he died on Friday, uh, but danced on Sunday, uh, he slept on Friday, huh, but shouted on Sunday. Huh. He already won both of them. Huh. Ain't that good news? Huh. Is there anybody here huh, that'll say God is alright? Huh. Ain't he alright? Huh. Ain't he alright? Huh. Say yes! Huh. Yes! Huh. Yes! Huh. Oh! Let God be God. Let God be God. If you trust Him, no condemnation. God, if you let him, he'll do a new thing in you. He'll do a new thing in your home and at work. He'll do a new thing in the halls of justice and poverty, stricken places, a new thing in the White House, in the courtroom, in the jailhouse, in the school building, a new thing in your family and in the church. But all of us may, must make sure we keep our eyes on Jesus and declare to the world, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. 
Ain't that good news? Not guilty. Ain't that good news? Not guilty. Though my sins be as scarlet, I have been made clean by the blood of Jesus. Not guilty. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who live in union with Christ Jesus who try to live your life by loving your neighbor who try to live your life by being a living and walking testimony of what God is able to do not guilty no condemnation stand with me all over God's house not guilty not guilty not guilty can you hear the Lord in, the, in heaven's courtroom I, I, I see God seated on the throne I, I can see him banging the eternal gavel because he got Jesus sitting on his right side Jesus is whispering in his ear praying for you father 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 forgive them and God declares the gavel of eternity not guilty mm. when you stand before the throne you want to hear him say not guilty not guilty Father God, we thank you for your Son and our Savior, Jesus.